to um, Kavita and David for setting this up and for the invitation, and to um, everyone this morning who completely um, laid the groundwork for what I want to do right now and said more eloquently than I think I might uh, be able to for so some of the conditions of possibility for um, for what's happening in the name of the generic, what's happening in the name of generic medicines in Mexico, it's my starting point. I don't think I'm only talking about generic drugs in Mexico, but that is my refraction device through which I want to raise some questions. Um, I'm working on a book project right now that I've been dwelling in for a long time, but it, that nonetheless is very uncooked, still quite raw. And um, I'm going to do my best to present things to you in a way that will allow you to help me. <laughs> it will help you to help me um, figure out what the hell I'm doing. Um, I have a bunch of questions that I think this group is uniquely well uh, disposed to help me think through. So that's my goal. Um, so right now the, the project is tentatively called New Same Things. Um, and let me just start off by saying this. The generic drugs are very uh, strange things, right? They're quietly nondescript, um, but quiet, uh, increasingly noteworthy sites of value and even distinction. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. Um, you guys probably know generic drugs, although I should actually never uh, assume such things. That's part of the point of this project. Generics are anything but generic. But you might know them as off-patent, cheaper versions of leading name drugs that once or perhaps still are under patent. So fluoxetine is generic Prozac. Ibuprofen is generic Advil, etc. Right Now, um, generics are these days very firmly in the sight lines of business intelligence firms tracking promising sites of growth in emerging pharmaceutical markets, um, from Brazil and India to Mexico and Thailand. Pharmacies selling only generics or copied drugs, and the nuances between those two terms are important. Um, uh, those pharmacies are increasingly uh, popular among middle and lower class consumers in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, elsewhere. Generics are certainly increasingly indispensable to the rather uh, ludicrously structured healthcare and insurance market of the United States, probably in uh, Europe as well. And um, they are ever more frequently folded into the business plans and portfolios of big pharma, which is um, you know, very quickly buying up as many generics labs as it can in anticipation of, of all of what I have just noted. Okay, so while generics are in these kind of grand terms, and certainly in the breathless assessment of like, you know, the New York Times, um, on the cusp of something golden, right, where <laughs> New York Times declared we're on the cusp of a generics revolution in the United States. Um, they are, and we are, nonetheless always haunted by the specter of their secondness, right? Does a cheaper copy mean a lesser copy? Do the less wealthy among us get inferior drugs? Where is the line between copy and counterfeit? Why does that question even have traction at all? Right? And that line between copy and counterfeit is one that just, it's, that it's sli one slides effortlessly into the other in lots of ways that are structurally overdetermined as well as kind of epistemologically overdetermined, right? Um, I want to get at some of those questions by looking at a sort of uh, complicated politics of substitution, of generic substitutability, uh, starting in Mexico. And my point of departure is um, it's a very serious one. Um, it is. How do I get there? Ah, oh, Dr. Simi. Very serious indeed. Um, this is the mascot of a Mexican pharmacy chain that's become my sort of, um, my, my point of entry for all kinds of things that I want to look at here. Um, Simi, uh, this is the mascot of a pharmacy chain. This is another version oops, of the mascot of the pharmacy chain in live, live in action. Um, and this is the pharmacy, a pharmacy storefront. Farmacias similares, okay? And their slogan, lo mismo, pero más barato. The same, but cheaper. Okay, now, um, CIMI has become uh, extraordinarily popular, successful, lucrative. It is a franchise chain, so there are probably 3,000 storefronts that have opened up since the early 2000s in Mexico. Um, a few words on the conditions of their emergence. Um, in Mexico, until the late 1990s or so, very early 2000s, um, if you walked into a pharmacy on a street corner, you know, a private sector pharmacy in that sense of commerce, um, the drugs that you could buy would have only been expensive leading brand, name brand drugs, Advil, um, Prozac, well you couldn't buy Prozac in a corner pharmacy anyway, but um, right, leading brand drugs. And there's no um, 
good reason for that in many senses. Many of the drugs that were uh, on sale in their expensive form um, had long ago, their patents had long ago expired, right? I mean, this is a question of sort of the U.S.'s um, tight integration with Mexico in terms of economic and trade uh, political terms, um, which had structured the market in such a way that generics were not known as a commercial um, category of drug, right? They were the things that you got for free in the Seguro Social, and even then they weren't called generics. You either got meds for free in the public sector pharmacies, or you bought medicina de patente, right? Patented drugs, leading brand drugs in the, car in the corner pharmacy. Now, you can imagine that in the wake of the peso devaluation in the mid-90s, um, among many other things, um, that situation became kind of unsustainable. In other words, those drugs were increasingly expensive. People had uh, decreasing amounts of money in their pockets. And um, medicines became unavailable in a kind of broad sense of affordability. So we're not talking about particular HIV um, drugs or particular drugs for particular diseases in the format that Achal was talking about. We're talking about a broad sense of general affordability, right? So the government um, did what a lot of governments have done recently, including the United States in the mid-1980s, um, including Argentina in the early 2000s which was to um, try and um, declare, decree, set in motion, uh, configure a new market, right? A market for a new thing called generic drugs, yeah? Um, and they did so with a series of, of decrees, including one meant to sort of set forth, set in motion, a kind of um, an active practice of substitution. So uh, physicians were no longer allowed to uh, prescribe the name brand drug. They had to prescribe a drug by its generic name, um, and that then took the decision making to the consumer and to the pharmacist rather than making that monopoly get, right, rather than sedimenting a monopoly at the point of prescription. Yeah? That's a tactic that many governments have taken uh, and contested in uneven ways uh, to try to break monopolies, right? And that's the very point of uh, this politics of generic substitution, right? Once you break that link between uh, the brand name and the drug in general, yeah, you've broken a monopoly. Right? This is the idea. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> the same but cheaper. Lo mismo pero más barato. Uh, I'm going to dwell on that phrase for a little bit. That's my entry point into a whole bunch of set of questions here, right? Um, on the one hand, the same but cheaper is, um, in the conventional sense of the term, a generic marketing formula, right? This is how commodity markets are configured, right? Standardization, regulation, harmonization in a kind of global WTO inspired way um, are in the business of making same things so that people can then differentiate them through marketing, through practices of consumption, through practices of brand identification and the rest, yeah? Now, um, Recently in the Washington Post, just a couple weeks ago, there were a series of articles uh, by a physician who was writing in the op-ed pages, and uh, he was sort of writing about, um, as a news item, you know, like, physicians continue to prescribe name brand drugs in the U.S., even though these cheaper generics are available. So why is that? And one of the people he interviewed in this piece is also a physician, said, well, you know, it's very hard to market something by saying it's, the, it's as good as, but cheaper. And that's exactly the phrase he used. Yeah, it's as good as, but cheaper. It just doesn't have the same sexiness. Okay, this is a, a common, I think we could identify with that, right? We say, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, um, try telling that to Dr. Simi, right? For whom literally the phrase, the same but cheaper, um, has become a wildly successful marketing claim. One that is anything but generic, that, that is tied and pegged directly to the sale of copied pharmaceuticals. And that has been so kind of um, popular and has generated so much buzz um, that it is being copied by other pharmacies selling copied drugs. <laughs> copied with a little bit of a difference, right? So, um, so if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, um, Dr. Simi's feeling very good indeed, right? This is a kind of copycat pharmacy, um, a no-name pharmacy, um, with the same iconography up to 75% cheaper, and you'll note it says the same substance, but cheaper. La misma sustancia, pero más barato, right? Um, we have this delightful image of two pharmacies, sort of twins of each other, but also clearly re referencing, indexing Dr. Simi, similares y genéricos. Um, we have farmacias del doctor, doctor ahorro, right? Pharmacies of Dr. Savings. It's equal, but more economic. Okay, now, um, 
in a way, then, we have here the kind of self-replicating, the meme that we're so familiar with in this uh, era of digital replication and of, um, you know, I made this throwaway reference to Baudrillard yesterday in, in a certain sense. A lot of people see the, these, this series of images and go, oh my god, Baudrillard, he was right after all, right? These kind of copies of copies of copies of copies, there is no original. I actually don't think that's the most helpful way into this formulation, okay, for a couple of reasons. Um, but one of them is, is I want to get into the operations of this move, what we're seeing here, right? Um, one of the things that's happening, if we think about the task of marketing, right, both from business and management textbooks, marketing textbooks, but also from, from cultural studies, people like Celia Lurie, Rosemary Coombs, really lovely work um, on cultural life of intellectual property. Um, we know that the task of marketing and branding is to carve, or create, invent even distinction out of a field of likeness, right? 18 different serials, this one gets branded as that. It differentiates, differentiates itself from others, but also from the generic, yeah? Well, what's Dr. Simi doing? One of the things he's doing is turning sameness and similarity, literally the term, lo mismo and similar, right, into his marks of distinction. So that all of these copies are clearly, no one sees them and does not, not think of Simi when he sees them, right? Um, and this leads me into a set of questions about the work that equivalence can do in this context, not in the world at large, not in some undifferentiated way, in a poor theory kind of way, what the work that equivalence can do as a proper noun, right? Um, the way that equivalent kinds can become distinctive kinds. And I, I think that is happening in the field of pharmaceuticals in a very particular way. And that's one of the things I want your help thinking about. Sort of what, What's our language around the commodity form? What's our language around value that helps us get at this? Okay, so that's one of the questions I want to ask. Um, and you'll see in a moment, I think, why I'm asking that. It's not just about the proliferation of commercial slogans on pharmacy um, chain marquees, right? <clears throat> now, there's a lot at stake, as um, Achelle's presentation this morning showed us very clearly. There is quite a lot at stake in um, determining what shall count as equivalence, right? Um, in thinking about the samenesses that matter, we're trained very well to think about the differences that matter, but um, we need to think about the samenesses that matter too, because they are plural and they are, um, they do proliferate, it turns out, okay? Now, um, sameness is an achievement, right? It's not to be taken for granted, especially in this arena. And, um, it is itself the subject of certain kinds of public um, PR campaigns on the part, say, of the government. I guess we'd call it a public service announcement, which in the early 1990s in Mexico was trying to um, kind of cultivate an awareness among Mexican consumers that you could indeed walk into a pharmacy and get a cheaper version of the drug they think they know, right? Um, and it will be just as good, right? I mean, this is the project of generic substitution, and many of us still... Um, resist that message in certain ways, and I, it's, it's very funny and interesting always to actually get into a conversation with any of us about what drugs we buy and when we buy a generic and when we don't and all this stuff, okay? It's not a straightforward proposition at all, this notion of, of equivalence and substitutability. Let me show you a poster that was part of one of these um, government campaigns, right? Um, <clears throat> it's the Lime Popsicle campaign. It's brilliant in its um, earnest simplicity. Okay, so remember, three popsicles taste good because of the lime. Okay, this is aimed at a sort of popular working class audience, right? La Paleta de Limón, super popular. Nothing could be more Mexican than a Paleta de Limón, right? Okay, the three popsicles taste good because of the lime, right? The three pills cure because of the active substance, right? What cures is the substance, the active substance. All right, now this is a kind of chemical reductionism that I'm very happy for a moment anyway to get behind. Right? I mean, my work on bioprospecting and the translation of indigenous knowledge into pharmaceuticals um, coughs up a whole other relationship to ke chemical reductionism where we're supposed to hate it, right? It, it's the thing that does violence to traditional knowledge. Well, here, a politics of substitution requires a kind of chemical reductionism. We need to believe in the, the substance, that pile of substance, right? And we want it to do its work, and we want it to be as good, right? We want that for others, and we want that for ourselves. We want that for a politics of substitution. <clears throat> now, it's a brilliant poster, I think, in part because it does not pose original versus copy, right? There's not 
a kind of, it's already level, right? This is an image of interchangeability, right? This is the project of generic substitution. You don't know that one of these came first. All you're doing is recognizing that different epiphenomenal <laughs> forms, different surfaces, um, no matter what they look like, will contain the same essence, right? So counterpose that very straightforward, rather beautiful message to um, the array of things one might buy when one walks into a farmacia similar or a farmacia de genericos or what, you know, one of these establishments. Okay, <clears throat> you could buy a regular generic. You could buy an interchangeable generic. Um, if you want to get precise about the kind of generics we're looking at, you could say, oh, these are branded generics because they're not being distributed for free in the social security system, right? They're they actually, they're called like Bestafen in the way that in the States you might buy a Walprofen or something like that. Um, and to make matters a little bit more um, complicated and exciting, um, a lot of people who buy generics, whether it's regular generics or interchangeable generics, so known in Spanish by their acronym GI, right? Hey. Um, you might buy a regular generic or a GI in a farmacia de similar, similares, right? But because you bought it in the similares, a lot of people say, ah, oh, yeah, I just bought myself a similar, right? Me voy a see me, me voy a comprar un similar, right? So I went to buy a similar, or I'm going to go buy myself a similar at Dr. Simi's, right? To which even the pharmacists at Dr. Simi's go, no, 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 like, no existe, right? There's no such thing as a similar. No, no, no. We sell medicines of quality, right? We sell generics, we sell GI, we do not sell similars, right? So, so an act of branding that's gone so well that the, the chain name is identified with what is being sold and it's a, it's a link that Similaris actually wants to break. Why? Because there's a representational politics at work here in which um, equivalence of certain kinds starts to get posed, counterposed, opposed to Similarity, mere similarity, right? True equivalence versus merely similar, and you don't want to get caught on the wrong end of that continuum, right? Okay. Right as if it's clear. Anyway, I will move on. Um, I'm not... I, as I go on, some of this, this list will start to distill itself a little bit, but I'm not going to um, sit here and explain it to you right now. So I want you to sit with a certain amount of confusion, because it's confusing. Um, but one thing it is not, okay, one thing this list is not, is simply a list of different terms for the same object, or for the same thing, okay? This list is an ontological mixture, right? It is cross-cut by certain regulatory categories, by certain kinds of commercial designations, right? Branded versus not branded, um, similares versus anything that exists in regulatory terms, right? Um, and that makes the things that these terms refer to different from each other, okay? And I just want you to hold on to that point. Um, there's lots of ways in which they're different. And I can go endlessly into the rabbit hole of all the ways in which they're different. And we'll go a little bit into that rabbit hole. But I'm going to try and keep it contained a bit so we can um, talk about all this. Um, let me just say that perhaps it's not surprising um, that in the midst of an explosion, and I tell you, you probably won't be surprised by this at all, in the middle of an explosion of pharmacies selling legally sanctioned copy drugs, right? These are not illegal pirated drugs. These are not um, counterfeit in any way that we might objectively call them counterfeit. Um, um, there is a market that, in copy drugs that has really expanded in Mexico, and it is cutting into the market in uh, leading brand drugs. The, of course, the transnational drug industry that has a very strong uh, industry presence in Mexico, in fact, Mexico's national camera or association of pharmaceutical representatives is mixed Right? It has domestic industry representatives, but it also has industry representatives from Wyeth and Pfizer and other companies like that. Okay? So those guys have been very um, suspicious and very um, um, determined to do what they have done in, in the U.S. and lots of other places, um, which is to continually cast doubt on the equivalence of these drugs, which, given the proliferation of different kinds of sameness, is not actually that Hard. Okay, so confusion works to the benefit of an industry that wants to make you think twice about what you're buying when you buy a generic, right? So, um, so for example, the, um, there, was a, there was a kind of a PR campaign by the transnational industry that um, asked people, um, do you feel better? This is directly directed at CME, right? Mm -hmm. 
do you feel better or do you feel similar? Right? Te sientes mejor or te sientes similar? Right? And, and so, okay, so these kinds of doubts are circulating at all kinds of levels. They're circulating at the level of confusion, right? Like, eh, what's a generic, what's an interchangeable generic, what, you know? Okay, so there's confusion at that level. And there's also this deliberate sowing of doubt, you know, in that way, which is quite brilliant itself. Um, and so you might not be surprised that um, people in Mexico, when they're asking questions about this, and they're like engaging with these practices too, they have their own kinds of, um, of taxonomies and ways of making sense of these, of these differentiations and samenesses, right? And so, um, you know, some people will say to me, oh yeah, you know, like this guy who um, is an importer of medicinal plants from Central America, he says, yeah, you know, generics are just like um, plants, right? They're pure. They're stripped of all the hype and the packaging and the bullshit, right? They are pure. Pura sustancia, okay? Other people are talking about taking generics the way they take homeopathic medicines, like it's kind of an alternative medicine, right? Um, people have their ways of trying to figure out what the hell is this, right? Um, and I, had, I can't tell you the number of conversations I had, usually with people who we might consider kind of working class, popular, popular class folks, um, who... Um, would say, I think, somewhat having absorbed this sort of decente similar campaign, but not quite buying it, right, would say things to me like, you know, yeah, claro, of course they're the same. Of course they're the same. Maybe they're a little watered down, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe they don't work as, as fast, so you have to take two. But I got all kinds of, you know, sort of musings like this. But they're the same. Of course they're the same, right? Quizás vienen rebajados, pero son lo mismo. Okay. Okay, so folks, people are, are um, finding ways to hold on to a certain tension. The tension that's actually embodied in a certain way in uh, Simi's slogan. Yeah, the same but. Okay, now price works as an obvious differentiator that if we're just talking about the configuration of a commodity market. But there's something else that's working here too. It's not just price. It never is just price. Yeah? So let me go to a, a kind of another, um, I'm going to bastardize that phrase a little bit, if I may. I love that word. Um, um, <laughs> Right, I'm going to take a little slightly pharmaceutical liberty with that phrase, the same and not the same but different, right? And so let's call it, um, let's call it the same and not the same. Same but cheaper, same and not the same. Now it's a phrase I actually take from pharmaceutical chemistry and I'll explain to you why in a second. But let me just um, point out, okay, this is a list of domains of practice, pharmaceutical chemistry, quality control, um, pharmaceutical regulation, right, harmonization, all these things that kind of work at the national level but are always already kind of wrapped up in processes of, of harmonization in, you know, Mexico's relationship to the U.S. These are arenas that we would look to and that we would assume, even from the literature on standardization, right, um, these are the arenas we would think would actually um, operate on this list to try and clear it up for us, right? Like, okay, here's a bunch of confusion, but clearly there are these regimes of standardization and harmonization that are going to do something about it, right? And to some extent, that is true. And I'll sort of show how that works in a second. But um, so on the one hand, there is a process of sort of what I'm calling like the harmonization of the proper copy, right? These are all legal copies in some way or another. But through processes of regulation, one of them will become the good copy. And the rest get siphoned away as the, as the not good copy. Okay, and that one is the, is the interchangeable generic, the KE. Okay. Um, at the same time, though, these domains are exactly the domains that produce those kinds of proliferations in the first place. Okay, so a bit like people who are willing to say, yeah, 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 they're the same. Maybe it's a little watered down, maybe it's a little different, but it's the same, right? In a funny way, these domains, pharmaceutical chemistry, the practices of quality control, um, the practices of regulation, hold that tension too, okay? And they hold it very well, and in fact, they produce it. They proliferate. They help produce those kinds of proliferations of, of different kinds of sameness, okay? So um, I'll just try to go give you some shorthand of how that works. Pharmachemistry, I, mean, I take the phrase same and not the same, the same and not the same, from the title of a book by a chemist named Roald Hoffman, who wrote a book called Same and Not the Same about the key kind of philosophical um, dilemma that is uh, wrestled with in chemistry in general, in pharmaceutical chemistry in particular. Yeah? 
In other words, the identity of molecules, even with themselves, okay, so we're not even talking yet about, you know, is my generic ibuprofen the same as Advil's ibuprofen, right? We're talking about, is a water molecule in my bathtub the same as the water molecule next to it in my bathtub? And the chemistry has all these idioms, all these ways of talking about molecules even, that are not identical to themselves or to the one next to it. They share the same name, but they have a different, um, they have a different geometry. Right? They might have a different, you might, um, if you're talking about a molecule that's synthesized, you may synthesize it via a different pathway, and that might give you slightly different results, right? You might end up with molecules that are handed, the way your right hand and your left hand are the same, but not interchangeable, right? And this has effects, actually, on how drugs uh, intersect, with intersect with receptors in your body and things like this, okay? There are very, very rich languages in chemistry about how things even at the level of that chemical compound at the bottom of that poster, can be simultaneously the same and not the same as itself, okay? Um, the history of quality control in drug manufacturing, and I'm not going to go into that history, but that's something that I'm trying to write about right now, um, also acknowledges very explicitly, and this is the history of quality control in the 20, early 20th century, acknowledges very explicitly that any two products coming off of an assembly line one after another. So we're talking about consistency within the same still, right? Is very, very, very unlikely to be exactly, exactly the same as the one before and the one after it, right? There's just no way. You're making millions and millions of the same product. Like, things are going to differ in certain respects. And so there was a redefinition of this equation between quality and equivalence in the early 20th century, which moved from a kind of emphasis on exactitude, these things have to be exactly the same, yeah, to a notion of, um, to a statistical notion of sameness, which was same more or less, same within upper and lower thresholds, the same within tolerance zones. Okay, so I'm interested in that notion of the tolerance zone, same enough. Okay, now um, both of those factors come into play a little bit when you talk about different levels of drug equivalence. So when we talk about the the relationship between regular generics. I'm calling them regular just to try and be sort of clear, but regular generics and interchangeable generics in Mexico, you have, in a way, a difference between two measures of equivalence that have been um, debated about in the US and the FDA and sort of have become part of a um, global struggle over what kind of copy shall count as a proper copy in the configuration of global pharmaceutical markets and a move away from uh, chemical equivalence, which is the picture you see in that Lyme Popsicle poster, right? These three drugs are the same because they contain the same chemical. That actually presents to us a kind of um, vision of the equivalence of two drugs, which is based on chemical equivalence. 200 milligrams of ibuprofen equals 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. There's a sort of fight over that in the uh, 60s and 70s in the US, which ended up sort of supplanting chemical equivalence in favor of a supposedly more, um, a more equal version of equivalence, bioequivalence, which I shall mention earlier. Okay. So, um, there are lots of reasons we can go into that, but let me just put it this way, that equivalence in the world of pharmaceuticals is heterogeneous to itself, right? There are many kinds of equivalents. They at times complement each other, sometimes they are proxies for each other, um, and sometimes they don't have a place in, this, in, the, in the language of equivalence at all, and I'll talk to you about where the similar comes back around um, later, okay? <clears throat> Now, what do we do with this? I want to raise three clusters of questions, which um, to me, which bring me to this meeting already, kind of ready to to think um, with you guys about this. Um, one is the question of uh, innovation and imitation, um, and I am sorry to have missed Ivan and Lucy's and others' presentations last week, the discussions last week you guys had about innovation, because I think there's something um, in those discussions for this material and vice versa. Okay. Um, I like Charles' phrase that he, I don't think you used it today, but you used it in your abstract of, of, about how if we look at India's patent law, the way it actually makes the threshold for patenting higher than it might be in the U.S., which is a perfectly brilliant way to, um, you know, give the U.S. the finger on this stuff. Um, you know, innovation is always different from itself. I think I'm paraphrasing you a, li a bit wrongly, but innovation has always been different from itself. Um, and you know, Lucy Suchman's work shows us that. Kavita, your work on piracy and the, what, is an, what is an author, what is a pirate author, <laughs> what is a pirate? Um, um, Yvonne's work, um, 
given us a lot of ways to start questioning the very notion of innovation. Um, one of the ways I want to bring Dr. Simi into that conversation, and I think it helps um, um, just helps us pose some questions in a, in a very particular way, um, is to think about um, the effects of shifting a conversation from, say, something like original versus copy to same and not the same, or to same but different, right? But I think that that, that, that change in syntax, and we can call it a semi syntax if you want, or chemical syntax if you want, right, um, actually um, opens up different kinds of questions than original versus copy does. And I think it allows for certain kinds of proliferations. There is something very explicitly Deleuzean about it, say Deleuze versus, you know, Plato or something, um, right? But there's something very Deleuzean about the way that that iteration allows for lots of things to be in relation to each other in a way that's not fully captured by intellectual properties, epistemologies around um, priority and secondness, right? Around first and then all that comes after. <clears throat> now, I think that this intersects in lots of ways with things we're seeing elsewhere. I think about um, the ubiquity of um, weird verbs, like versioning, <laughs> iterating, um, right? The way that it's become almost second nature for us to talk about innovation as being different from itself. Mm -hmm. Now in a digital age, or whatever kind of era making um, you know, technologies we want to throw, throw at this problem, right? Um, the, the, the kind of critical apparatus that we have at our disposal to say innovation is different from itself is actually that which is um, animating certain kinds of, you know, corporate R&D, and also just our, our kind of everyday languages for what it means to make new things at the moment. We're always making same new things. And that recognition isn't, doesn't work as expose, to, to bring that question back, right? It's part of the language of innovation right now, right? Um, and there's even been, like in the business and management literature, um, a kind of resurrection of, you know, appropriately, something from the 1930s and 1940s on this point, right? Joseph Schumpeter's definition of innovation as the recombination of existing elements, right? That that has come back into favor, not as like an aha gotcha moment, but like, yeah, that's what we, that's, not just that's what we've always done, but oh, that's what we need to do, right? Um, so that I think it's very easy for us to talk about that as standing in for creativity and innovation right now, and I think we need some critical languages around that, yeah? Now, um, if innovation's always different from itself, so to his value, and I want to ask this audience some questions about how we think about the production of value, right? Um, in this kind of context and other kinds of context. Um, you know, Marx was, of course, I think, the first and probably best ethnographer of, of equivalence under capitalism. And, you know, you think, on the one hand, he's very clear, and we use the, the notions that come out of... Um, Capital Volume 1 very readily, that equivalence is the kind of um, the engine of value production under capital. We need equivalence as an abstraction to make that system run. It does violence, right? Um, at the same time, Marx was very clear that equivalence not only is unnatural in this certain sense, right, but that it's always different from itself. And he talks about, for example, if we think about relative value, in Marx, right? Where he talks about how, you know, you make an equation, A equals B, right? 20 linens equals one coat, yeah? If you reverse the position of the linens and the coat, forgive me those of you who know this by heart, you reverse the position of the linens and the coat, right? You have a different statement. You still have an equation, but the valuation, it's a quantification, that's a qualification. The value, um, what's being measured through what changes. And, and it's very easy to do that thought experiment with generics and original drugs. So, if, so I've even done it in this paper and in this work I often say, okay, the, so the point is to show that the generic is equivalent to the name brand drug. Well, it sounds really different to say the task is to show that Advil is the same as, IV, as generic ibuprofen, right? Like, you know, the way that the syntax works already puts the burden on one thing to be measured against the other thing, right? And Marx was very, very clear that that is a way that equivalence itself kind of undoes itself from the inside, right? Now, um, why should that matter to us here? I, I have some questions about how this stuff of versioning or iterating or making same and not quite same things in the pharmaceutical world um, 
speaks to the way we tend to talk about post-industrial capitalism or post-industrial economies or information economies. And here I actually want to ask you if I'm, um, if I'm making some mistaken assumptions here, okay? But um, I think we tend to talk about the information economy, again, a kind of, you know, at least late 90s, late 80s, late 90s um, version of things. Um, in t by putting the emphasis on the work of branding, of marketing, of signage, right? Signs and symbols. Um, and in part, it's related to this idea that, that marketing and branding create all kinds of value on top of what is essentially this kind of numbing sameness of commodity things, right? Um, that, that we no longer pay attention to making new things. We just re-engineer our relationship to brands. Yeah, I think that's a fairly commonplace um, I might be wrong about that, right? But I think that's a fairly commonplace, maybe sort of cultural studies-ish formulation of where value comes from in an age of sort of consumption, right? Mass consumption. Um, and I think one of the things that that formulation does of interest to this group in particular, I think, is that it seeds sameness and it seeds things, right? It seeds the commodity as already being identical. And the way we talk about commodity capitalism as the reproduction of certain kinds of equivalents and I think if we look at pharmaceuticals, generics, or even originals, and all the ways that they can actually be different from themselves, and I haven't gone into all of that. There's like a hundred different material ways in which um, two drugs can actually be the same as, but, but totally different from each other in lots of ways that are not scandals, but that nonetheless um, confound our notions of exact uh, sameness. Um, so if we actually try and think again, about what the commodity does if it's not the same, if it's actually um, sort of generating all kinds of inequivalency, right, very comfortably, frankly. Um, what does that do to how we talk about where value is coming from, right? And so somewhere in there is this, is this uh, conflation that we often make between value and distinction, okay? The things have to be slightly different from each other in order to um, generate something called value at the same time that they have to be the same. Okay, um, now, there are a couple of people who I find useful for thinking about this stuff. Okay, one of them is uh, Jane Geyer, who's an anthropologist, uh, economic anthropologist who works um, for a very long time, very established Africanist. And um, she has a really beautiful book called Marginal Gains. Um, and in it, she's interested in kind of revisiting sort of generalized theories of value, not as general theories of value at all, but like thinking about them from the ground up, which is very detailed engagement, rereading of both the kind of ethno-historical archive and her own ethnographic work in West Africa. Um, and it's important to me both methodologically, and I'll, I think you probably see why, uh, in terms of this notion of thinking about these things from the ground up, but it's also important sort of substantively in terms of what she's actually showing, which is that she goes through all of this really intense rereading of, of, um, of an archive in order to um, show how, against general theories of value, um, inequivalence actually becomes very central to how gain is produced to accumulation. Okay. Um, and so far from confounding our notions of how capitalism works and all this stuff, inequivalence is actually really central to how um, to how gains are operationalized, at least in the context that she's talking about, okay? So I was thinking about that, and then I'm thinking, well, what kind of ground, if we're talking about from the ground up, what kind of ground is the generic pharmaceutical? And I, I never want to use that term in the singular for reasons you probably um, can probably guess, right? Um, what kind of ground are pharmaceuticals, plural? What kind of ground are generic pharmaceuticals? Um, and that's where I get into maybe some science studies language around sort of irreducible materialities, right? Um, uh, materialities that are important to the story that structure things in particular ways, but do not determine them, right? Um, and so I, I actually think there's a discussion to be had in this, especially in this group, about um, where materiality, <laughs> where new materialisms might come into our analyses, what, you know, what that term stands for, the work that it does for us as we think about its relationship to other analytics. Um, so I'm just going to flag the term there. Um, and there's also, these are just, these are just words, 
They're important words, right? Contradiction of postcolonial liberalism. Z plurals everywhere, right? Um, you know, for all of us ambivalent readers of Homi Baba, right? I mean, you can't you can't help but think white not quite when you hear same but not the same, or at least I can't. Um, and and that, that's not an analytic that just travels willy-nilly easily from here to there to there to there. But, um, but the notion of, um, of a substitute that is the same as but cheaper than the foreign-made, you know, expensive, really good pro product has a very vivid very specific but very um, recognizable set of histories um, in Latin America. We tend to, and not only there, but certainly in Latin America, we tend to codify those histories around um, the era of EC of, in, of import substitution industrialization, right? Um, you know, an economic and political paradigm that structured the better half of uh, sort of national trade policies for the uh, 20th century, um, right? In which the production of national substitutes. Electrodomesticos in Argentina, right? Domestic appliances or cars or refrigerators or, you know, um, petroleum catalysts in Mexico. Um, right? The, the, the production of the national substitute, and that's very much how Simi organizes his kind of rhetorical project as well. It's not just in terms of the market in a, in a narrow sense, but like protect your domestic economy, he says, by which he means household and national, right? Um, that he's, he's signaling very explicitly a kind of history and a generation of people who um, who experienced that call as a call to a certain kind of identification with the nation, right? Um, and yet, with a difference, yeah, I mean, he's doing that kind of through the guise of the market and with an explicit attack on the state. Okay, so there are lots of resonances there, lots of sort of uh, histories we can trace out there. Um, but obviously, in the midst of all that, too, is a, is, is a, quant you know, a quantification that is a qualification that, that undoes itself at every turn, which is the promise of equality, like promise through liberal citizenship, right? And people see this very explicitly, and especially in these worries, right? Is this a, is a cheaper copy a bad copy, right? Um, and, and it's almost, it's conceivable that no matter what kind of um, regulatory proof is offered, that yes, they are the same, that, that that will be a story that will be impossible to undo in certain ways. Um, both because it's, to the transnational industry's interest to um, foment that story, but also, but not just that, that's too easy, right? That there is um, a, a very deep um, sort of experience people have, um, that there are, of course, stratifications in, um, in all kinds of things, in markets, in access to, to things, and in the promises of sort of citizenship um, that make it very, very hard to um, talk about equivalence in an unmediated, unqualified sense. Right, equivalence just for its own sake. Um, now, finally, with that point in mind, you know, I mean, we we the history of bioequivalence um, in the U.S. and then as it gets harmonized, it becomes a gold standard in Mexico and India and other places. Um, is one in which you know equality is conflated very easily. Equivalence becomes the necessary condition for quality, right? And there's lots of ways in which pharmacologists can give you a million examples in which, you know, the generic has a radically different bioequivalent curve than the original, but it actually works better, okay? Like, there's no reason why inequivalence ends up falling on the, um, you know, on the generic as being the bad copy, right? But of course, there's every reason why that continues to happen. Um, but it, that formulation forces us to ask, Right? To, to what extent is same enough good enough? Right? And that's the truce that these regulatory categories and all kinds of categories sort of make, you know, tol sameness within sort of upper and lower limits and all that stuff. There's a kind of truce that gets made, right? In which sameness, same enough becomes good enough. And then you think, well, what are the politics of advocating good enough? Right? That seems like a very, um, that's a very measured thing to ask for. Good enough, yeah. And so, um, but it's very much at stake, I think, with the politics of generic, and not in strictly technical terms, right? But in terms of its political valences, its uh, historical resonances. Um, you know, and so I, I'm just struck with the phrase, and I want us to sort of think about what, where that goes, what it means. Um, and, and the final thing I want to um, kind of 
throw out to you. So this is a series of provocations, series of questions. Um, I don't know, uh, Joe Dumit, I don't know if in your presentation you talked about the even more. Did you talk about the even more that was in your abstract? Oh, you should have talked about it even more. Um, <laughs> So Joe brought up this phrase, the even more, right, um, in his abstract, which as far as I understand, it was sort of asking us to think about where, where does the even more of capitalism and the, the pharmaceutical risk stuff especially, um, where does it intersect or to what effect might it intersect with the even more of a kind of scientific curiosity um, or with Stenger's kind of queries of what nature can tell us or what we can do with it in some way. Um, and I was very, very, very struck by this notion of the even more. And um, one of the things I'm trying to figure out in relation to generics, in relation to um, sameness and similarity and, the, and in interchangeability as proper nouns that actually distinguish, so the interchangeable is different from the equivalent, is different from the similar, okay? So I'm... I'm some sort of straightforward political economic analysis might say, and I think this is actually probably right <laughs> in lots of ways, um, we've run out of ways to make new things. This is a stock story. We've run out of ways to make new things, and there's only so much value you can squeeze out of um, Me Too drugs and whatever. And so now value, I don't, I don't normally talk in these terms. Now value is cannibalizing the same, right? It is finding ways to make value out of different kinds of sameness by making differences in the name of sameness. Okay, so there's weird kind of cannibalization. So I think we could go there, yeah. And if that's happening, I think that the good enough itself, which sounds like a kind of closing down almost, good enough is like, meh, there's a kind of wilting affect to the good enough. But I think, uh, affect, but I think there's a way that this generic stuff is giving us a site where the good enough is meeting or becoming the even more, right? It's, it's proliferating, right? Sameness is kind of proliferating other kinds of samenesses which become ways for people, companies, capital markets, I don't know what, um, to carve out particular kinds of niches and to demand allegiance and for people to identify, right? And so um, I, just, I just want to end on that. That's just like a craziness. But um, anyway, I thank you for your indulgence, and um, I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.